Welcome to the shop. I'm glad that you're here tonight. We are going to delve into the world of hinges and setting hinges, uh, particularly what I call butt hinges, which I've probably used more than any type of hinge on a lot of the fine furniture that I've made. So remember, if you like this content, go ahead, like, share, and subscribe, and all that good stuff. <laughs> See how fast we can say that, right? <laughs> Everybody knows what it is, right? All right, so tonight I'm going to show you how to set this type of hinge. It's, um, I'm not, I guess it's called a butt hinge because all you end up seeing is the barrel of the hinge or the butt of the hinge. I'm just making this up as I go along. <laughs> Never thought about it really that much. Most of the, the descriptions for hinges are, or the names for hinges are descriptive to the way they look, like a knife hinge, for instance, or, you know, it opens almost like a jackknife. And here we've got two leaves. So you've got the leaves of the hinge, and then you have that center barrel we get into the terminology here. And then in the center of the barrel, there's actually a pin. So you have that pivot point around the pin. Now, when you order hinges, they'll tell you what size, you know, overall in general. Um, these hinges that I, I use here, I've used them for years and I really love them. They're, they're actually from Horton Brasses. And uh, no sponsor here. I mean, this goes way back before the internet. <laughs> but um, using these brasses, they're really well made. This, um, they have a couple different levels of hinges if you want to go there. We did put a link to this type of hinge in the notes. So you can go right there and check them out. But these are the precision butt hinges that they sell. They also have a rolled butt hinge that is a little less precision. <laughs> Actually, I, I think it's still a fine hinge, but you know how you can see that the, the metal is actually kind of rolled or pressed around the pin rather than this case, these are like forge or they're just so beautiful. There's no, the tolerance is really tight on them, but they operate so fine. And what else I like about them is that all of the holes for the screws are indexed exactly whether it's this way or this way. So sometimes you get hinges and they're kind of funky. The holes aren't drilled really precisely, margin off the edge, and it ends up causing more complication. You gotta mark the right hinge that you have it oriented the proper way and all that good stuff. So these are two of the same, the PB, um, whatever they are, I think four they're 409. Four yeah, so you can also get them with a ball on the end of the barrel, and that's just the, the ball version of the, the uh, precision butt hinge. They're not cheap, but when you're making fine furniture, hey, you don't want to skimp on the hinges. Mm -hmm. and in fact, I want to show you one of the pieces that, I, just a little photograph I had in my office. <laughs> Actually, it's not my office. It's been on the wall. You probably have seen it in the background, but I pulled it down just to show you this, um, that this sideboard, which is basically all veneered, everything you see is Cuban mahogany veneer, the ribbon pattern over solid mahogany legs. And then I've got ebony um, down here. But this is a classic kind of sideboard um, from the federal period, but it's not a direct copy of any one. It's kind of contemporized with the way that I use the veneer, a little less flashy. You notice there's no, none of those bell flowers and all that contrasting white and dark. I try to just stay more one tone and use the veneer more as a, as a dramatic pattern without all the noise of all the tiny little flashy inlays, which, you know, have their place. I don't know against them, but just contemporizing and taking some liberties with a traditional form to make it your own. You know, that's what I love to see. I love when you guys do that too. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, 
the thing about it, when you do this kind of thing, what you can also say if you're selling it is, yes, it's very contemporary and charge much more than if you put all those bellflowers in and made it old, right? So it's an art piece. So you save yourself all that time of doing all that inlay and you get to sell it for more. <laughs> it didn't really work out that way. Uh, it's still, I made probably three of these and there's a lot of work in these guys. But the main thing I want to show you is that's a center drawer and these two sides are actually, this whole thing is a bow front. So these sides are curved and these doors are that uh, eighth inch bending ply core. And then they've got a solid edge into which we mortised these butt hinges. And these I'm almost sure are this very same style hinge right here okay so yeah you can see it right there i'm just trying to remember if, it, if they were the two or the two and a half they look like they could be the two and a half but anyway so that's there i've got two sizes here i've got the two and a half and the two these are just some that i had hanging around i don't have actually a matched pair to show you tonight so I'm going to inlay one of each and we'll get to see it. Now what do you try to do here? I try to um, set the hinges into the piece such that the barrel is kind of discreet. It doesn't jump out at you. It's not too loud. If you can bury it even in like like we've talked about the cock beating on the drawers. Um, there have been times when I've actually had a little bit of a larger cock beating around a door or something. And you try to lay it so that the barrel almost gets lost in the bead. So you can really hide it pretty well. Here I've got an ebony line inlay all around that door that is about 3 16 of a line. And I fully set it in so I'm just right along the edge of that line. But still, you can't totally hide it in this case. But still, if I didn't tell you those were there, you probably wouldn't, it wouldn't jump out at you um, in terms of the piece. Um, anyway, that's it. I, I noticed the other hardware that I chose for this, you know, when it comes to choosing hardware, if you're not going to make your own, this is kind of um, inspired by some of, let's see, what's that guy's name? Ruhlman, um, Jacques Ruhlman, who was a, a very accomplished designer, maker in the um, Art Deco period in France, um, right around the turn of the century, 1920. And some of his most beautiful work, it's highly dramatic with using patterns of veneer like this, quite often, often Macassar ebony. And he was known, well, what I loved about it was the selection sometimes of these bold pulls. Some of them, I believe they were even ivory, which we wouldn't do now anymore, but they were like these large white hoops on some of his pieces or just a large tassel. Um, so I wanted something when choosing this because of the patternation kind of of this front in the Art Deco manner, I wanted a pull that was more see-through. So it didn't kind of obstruct the front, but it actually had a little panache like the uh, Ruhlman poles without obscuring the figure of the, the grain. So when you're choosing your poles, you really got to think about what are you really, what's this piece trying to affect? What are you trying to prove? What are you trying to prove with this? <laughs> what, are you, <laughs> what are you trying to make or, I was going to say, what are you trying to say with this piece? But that would be a little too esoteric, right? I'm not going to get that. <laughs> I'm trying to say that I'm trying to get a lot of money for something that I didn't do a lot of work on. <laughs> no. no, I'm just kidding. Right. This, this is a time-consuming piece because you have all these pieces that come together, but they're all veneered. And so yeah, they were all veneered before they were joined. So you can see, you can't even really see hardly the seams where they come together here. But... Anyway, someday we'll do a piece uh, that reflects some of the, the approaches and the feeling of this sideboard. But I just wanted you to see those hinges so we can move into our hinge setting. Now, um, I had a couple people ask me or mention 
about the Blanket Chess project, which I think it's the only project to date that I have built that utilizes these hinges. And I believe I do specify these very hinges. I think it's three of the two and a halves that go across the back. And if you have the full size drawing, it's noted on there the same number that you can see in the notes for this episode. Excuse me. Um, so anyway, um, I want to show you the method for doing this. And this would be obviously very similar to what you'll do on the blanket chest if you're building that project. But the orientation is different because you have a top and a back, but it's almost like this. So I had to come up with some kind of pieces that I was going to show you with and, you know, not try to, you know, make it look somewhat real. So I got these two pieces of wood here, <laughs> really sophisticated. I've got a chunk right here and this is my door and this will be my leg. Now this is kind of an oversized leg, but so what? I can always use it for something, right? But I think I'll just mount this as a door right here almost like looking at that piece. So we'll, we'll put the smaller of the two hinges up here and the larger at the bottom. Now, normally, I'm trying to think if I've ever changed the size of the hinges like that. I think I have done that on some period pieces. The, the top one is a little smaller, but um, for the most part, I've always used the same size hinges and um, set them on here. Now we're gonna just treat it like a panel. Um, if this were actually a door, like an old traditional, this I grabbed from the library. This is a, a frame, like for frame and panel, but this has uh, got a nice molding on it. Pretty sweet little miter joint there with a full tenon. So that's a, a nice, honest way of building a mortise and tenon door. And then, so you see, you've got this rail at the top, which is about two inches. And then this at the bottom, which is about three and a half. I think that top one's about two and a quarter. And then this one's not fitted yet, but it would have to be mitered here. But I'm just showing you this because typically when you set the hinges on a traditional piece, you want to you know, it's like, where do I go? How high do I go on the, on the door? Well, the vast majority of period pieces, if you notice this, um, you could have this rail set in here, like that top of that line, not the bead, but the line where it carries right over at the base there. If you squared right across, that would be the bottom of that hinge. So you have some kind of visual alignment to relate that hinge placement too. And then you guessed it at the top. It's the same, it's, it's not down here. It actually would be right there. So it's aligned. The top of the hinge is with that line on the rail. All right, so now I can justify having kept this for 15 years. All right. <laughs> with all my other stuff. See how important it is to have that stuff up there? I stand corrected. <laughs> All right, so let me uh, get my chalk. All right, so if this were a real piece, which we're going to treat it like it is, this would be my door. So I'm going to say this is my face. And somewhere in here, I don't really care, this will be the face of the leg. And I'm going to put my hinge here. I'm just, this is not an exact placement, but I know I'm going to be something like that. And then I'll be something like that over here. Okay, so the barrel will be exposed here. Now, how far out should the barrel protrude? You know, should you go all the way out to where you see that leaf and you have it sticking out like the full barrel pretty much? Or what? Do you go right to that point? Nay, nay, nay. We, uh, the best look, I think, and what I'm going to try to show you right now, is to set the barrel so that it's centered on the pin. So basically you have half the cylinder of the barrel proud of the drawer front. 
That way it's pretty discreet and it's pivoting right on that face. It's buried kind of in the door. It looks great. You know, it's not, sometimes you see hinges and they're like sticking way out like that. And it's like, why? You, come on. It doesn't take that much more time. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, it could be that the hinges were bad or something like that. But anyway, if you have a thick door, then you're going to just set the margin to whatever. But um, just so that you'd measure back from the center of the pin or the barrel out to the leaf. Now, if you can see, I don't know if you can see this, but I'm right at the edge of the leaf. And to the center of the barrel is three quarters of an inch on the money. Okay, so when I lay this leaf here, you'd expect it to be an inch and a half. So see, there's an inch and a half hinge by two and a half. But the inch and a half is what we want. So we're going we're gonna to set the edge of this leaf three quarters of an inch to the center of the pin. Okay, or the, our, our inlay recess will be three quarters deep. Now, I'm going to start with the small one. And what we're going to start with is the good old hand method, okay? So let's set it into the door first. I'll turn it so you can see it. We're just going to pick a place here. Now, what I did here was um, I could have dressed the thickness of this, this um, door however I wanted, but I, got, I thickness it right to three quarters. So this one, the leaf is going to be fully set and it'll be flush on the inside right there, okay? Now, of course, if it was a thicker door, you'd have a little bit of material behind it, and that's always um, delicate when you're chiseling that out. So if you have a thicker door, you're gonna do this a little differently, but you'll see that similar approach when we put it into the leg, because that's plenty heavy. All right, so what I did was I set up a little square to the three quarter inch thickness. And you can see on this, this little uh, double, double square, I'm right spot on three quarter. I can no longer see what I'm doing. Cam ready came in for the shot, <laughs> totally buried it. I don't know why I don't think about that. So anyway, <laughs> you're in your own world. I am. I've got, um, <laughs> so you could set a board like that if you wanted to get exactly this thickness, which is actually how I did this. I set the board there, and I loosened and slid the blade over and, and locked it in. Now I know I'm dead flush, and that's going to give me uh, here. It doesn't really matter that much. I'm just going to go full through. But when we go here... We're going to set that hinge right to that line, which will give us the nice setting, and we should end up hunky-dory. All right. We have a question. Uh, sure. Stuart's asking, how do you account for seasonal movement in the wood when setting up the hinges? Uh, seasonal movement is an issue, you know, really in the door width. So you don't, you don't really worry about seasonal movement on the hinge side because that gap, in this case, is only like a sixteenth of an inch. If I put these two leaves parallel, I've got about a sixteenth of an inch gap there. And that's the reveal or the gap that I'm going to go for here. I try, when I set a door, to have it the same all the way around. Now, if you've got styles, uh, like a raised panel door, you've got grain running vertically on the two styles and then the horizontal for the rails, the top and bottom. So those top and bottom rails are not moving at all, really, dimensionally across the door opening. But those styles are expanding, contracting a little bit. So I usually try to choose quarter sawn material to minimize that amount of movement, which is about, you'd have two pieces that are about five inches. So um, you just want to be careful. It's not going to move a whole lot. Uh, in the case of that sideboard that I showed you, that's a laminated, um, ply, basically, I think it's about five or six layers of Italian bending ply. And so that's not moving at all. It's super stable, and it's stable on the curve. So my advice, if you don't want to worry at all about expansion contraction, 
veneer that thing <laughs> and uh, make it solid, you know, over a nice stable substrate. But we're gonna go now with this solid door. This, I, I mean, I'm, I guess that makes you think of it because here I've just got a piece of wood and that's my door. But I, you never would construct a door, or very rarely, in one solid piece like this, occasionally. But in, if you do that, you don't want to, if you had a door like 15, 16 inches wide, you don't want to have it set into an opening. It's going to be moving a lot. So you'd want to have it so it was free out this edge. Sort of like a, that um, Cooper door that we did that's going to be inside of a, a door. All right, so let's get back. We're going to set this hinge right about here. I'm going to turn it so you can see. And let's just lock it into the vise. And I haven't done this for a little while, but I tried to knock a little rust off earlier, but we'll see. It doesn't really matter. So I'm going to set this on here. I've got a two inch hinge. So what I want to do is just mark the width of it. So I'm going to take my scalpel and just make a cut right in tight to it, right there. And then I'll do the same down here, nice and tight without moving it and then slip it aside. Now I can actually I'm going to use my marking knife. And if you want to be real precise about your marking, remember your marking knife has a bevel on one side and it's flat on the other. So you always want that flat side to be your outside. Always place the bevel to the waist or inside if you're going to make a, a deep cut because you start to widen the cut on the bevel side slightly. But that's getting nuanced, you know. You don't have to go too crazy with that idea. But I just did there so i'm going to turn this way for this side put my my knife right in the line i just made and score right across and just raise your head so you can look right over the light while you do that <laughs> and <it's> like, <laughs> this light is like an obstacle course every time but I love it because it gives me enough to see what I'm doing. All right, so now I'm just making these little cuts come around the corner just a touch. Okay, now this one I'm going to do kind of old school. And so first I'm going to mark it out with the knife. And I'm going to finish the depth of this cut with a good old router plane. Okay, so you haven't seen me use this, I know, for a while. I had to dust it off a little. I actually don't use it a whole lot. I should use it more, but the, the occasions aren't as frequent as you might think. Because um, a lot of times you can just set the plunge depth on a straight cutter bit and vacate, you know, the, the recess and get your perfect uh, depth. But the router plane is really super to finish it up because it's like a controlled chisel at the perfect depth. I'm going to show you more. What I'm going to do is we're going to rough it out, basically. We're going to cut the depth almost the full way, and we're going to finish it with the router plane, which is the way you can finish the bottom of dados sometimes because when you have a house joint, it goes into a dado. It's nice. You want to know that that bottom floor of that dado is true all the way across. That's not always true when you run a cross cut on a table saw. Um, but I mean, usually you can get pretty close with a router, but it's a pretty sweet tool. You can also use it for inlay, like medallions or whatever. It's, it's got a lot of opportunity. So we got a chance to use it. We're going to use it now. Okay. So I'm uh, setting, I'm going to set this little, this other little square to the thickness of the leaf. If you see what I'm doing here, sorry, the camera lady is trying to type as well. Mm -hmm. She is unbelievable, multitasker, multitasker. So I'm setting this so it's not quite the full thickness, but almost. So that'll give me a little bit to finish with the router plane. Um, it's too much material to, you go, if you use the router plane for the whole thing, it's not as fast as if you 
we'll just chisel out the, the waste first um, down to a line and then you can switch out to the router plane. The router plane is more of a finishing cut than it is a full chiseling tool, you know, to like to do a big depth. So I'm just making these little guidelines so I know where to stop my knife depth. But I'm going to use this, this setup right here. And we'll just pull it toward me here. Okay, so that'll be the line we go to there. And then on this side, same thing. I was going to set up my marking gauge to make this cut line, but I couldn't adjust those blocks. I never really set it to try to, you know, cut that close to the fence. And the way the knife is set in the marking gauge, you couldn't get it that close to the fence. So I think possibly you can with the, um, the round ones, but someone will have to let me know. I mean, how close can you get the knife cutter on one of those round marking gauges to the fence? It's probably, it's, I think it's pretty tough to get under an eighth of an inch. It's so rare, right? All right, so now I'm gonna rough this out. I'm gonna just take my big chisel and it's almost like setting a door lock or, you know, this is almost like carpentry here. You know, I don't often think of that, but where you'd be setting a hinge, a door hinge. You know, it's the closest you get to doing carpentry work in the shop. And I'm gonna just lock this in a little tighter. And I'm just gonna make these straight down cuts. This, these are, they're like stop cuts or depth cuts. And it's shortening the grain so I can remove it easily from the mortise, just like you would if you were setting a hinge on a job site. So then you can come in this way. So I put bevel down now so I can scoop more. Let's start right here. And those little pieces just pop right out. Come back the other way. Okay, notice how I, came, I did my first one off of that line. So the bevel on the chisel won't drive it beyond the line. All right, let's see how far I gotta go. Oh, pretty close already. So I think that was pretty good. I'm trying not to overshoot my knife line. That wouldn't be great. And here I'll just make a little cut. Now I'm going to set this one right in the knife line that we first established. You can feel it in there nicely. And we'll come back the other side. I'm getting all out of alignment here, but that's okay. Now I'll just clean this up into the corner and I'm gonna lay it on its side here so I can see the other knife line. Okay, good. Um, let me put a piece of scrap under here. In case I go through. I don't want to make any marks on my bench. <laughs> That's sort of like... That would be awful. Don't, don't scratch my car. You might put a scratch in one of my dents. All right, so I'm just gonna do this by hand because I just have a, a little bit to do. I don't, this is not the full depth here because unless I just overshot it there, I hope I didn't, hope I didn't go too deep with that, but we'll see. If we did, we're maybe a little on the inside, but. All right, so now I've got the, I'm going to use the router plane for the last bit. If we lay that leaf on there, I, I'm going to set it so it's flush with that leaf. That feels almost perfect. Yeah. So there's a stop on there. So you can dial this down. And once I got it where it was flush with the leaf thickness, I locked in the stop. Now I can loosen it. I'm going to raise it up a little bit and tighten it. So we'll, this is going to just do a very light kind of cut. And let's see if we've 
we don't have a lot there. The place I think I might have gone a little too far is on this side. Uh, maybe not. Okay, so now I can go all the way to the bottom. That was um, a more aggressive roughing out cut than I had done earlier. All right, so now these, the way this works, they might want to see this from the top. I don't, I don't know, can you see it from there? I'm not sure what you want to show them. So let me well, here. just how this is, I'm, I'm kind of pivoting. I'm holding this post flat and so I can feel the flatness on here and I'm letting that cutter which is just sweeping right on plane with this sole but at the depth. I'm going to step in front. So now we'll pivot from this side. Let's go this way. We've got to come in each side so we don't tear it out too much. Yeah, I did slightly go too much, so I was a little more enthusiastic. So don't be that crazy with the initial driving cut, but it's on the inside, so well, it'll be hand done. <laughs> Actually, it was when I was chopping it out. I went just slightly. Okay, so this is just beautifully pairing that floor flat. So all of that is beautifully in plane, except for right here where I <laughs> undercut. So all this is in nice plane. So now we can put our leaf in there. And I can feel them nice and flush. Fits beautifully. Okay. So now if I go full flush on the inside, you can see how that barrel's going to sit. Let's bring it up. Just like that. Looks pretty sweet, huh? All right, now we're gonna get the other side into the leg. So this time, let's say I'll pick a spot. Yeah, that looks good. Right about here. Now, normally you'd have a door, you'd set it in place, and I'd transfer the knife lines to the, the leg. But I'm just going to start in any spot, since this is just for a demo. We'll start right here. And here. Okay, now this, I'm going to take a pencil first and square across just inside those lines. Just so I can see where I should knife it on the inside. All right, so this is the full depth where we want to be. So we're going to knife right on across there. I'll use my scalpel for a nice thin line. I just drag that across. Let me put it in the vise. That again. So I'm going to make light cuts because if I go too hard, the, the knife wants to track with the grain. That's one advantage to the larger knife. This is going to be a little wider. It's more rigid. It doesn't flex and want to move with the grain as much as the surgical scalpel there. Okay, now that I've got my lines over there, now I can come this way and get that knife cut over again. And one more time here. You do a bunch of these, you get kind of proficient at it. How would you fix that mistake, Tom? James asking. Oh, I would slow down. <laughs> I normally wouldn't go quite as carelessly there, but I would probably, um, it's on the inside, so what would I do? I would, I would patch it with some wood. I would probably just take a piece of veneer, and given that it's smooth, I would try to make it a smooth dish, and then 
take something with a little compression like a pad and just put like one of these guys. So you could almost take a piece of veneer and squeeze it so that rubber is going to kind of conform and press that in. And then I would tr trim it with a chisel because now you know you've got the veneer. It's, it's like a piece of veneer. In that. And then once that's dry, then I would just keep my, my um, router plane set to the same depth and I just shear it and I would be patched. So that's why this would be really helpful. It's keep your depth stop all set and no one would ever see that. But yeah, you gotta, it's amazing how good you get at thinking of how to cover up your messes as you've done this a long time. <laughs> There's less panic and more feeling like, oh no, what am I gonna do now? I'll, I'll figure something out because you've done it before. <laughs> So let's just make this, just bring this line up a little. Now this is my depth cut. Let's go ahead and get this. This is again uh, for the hand cutting of the mortise. Now you're gonna appreciate the machine jig method all the more after doing this, right? That's partly the reason I want you to see this full method. Lou Tuna Tiger says the Veritas um, marking gauge goes to zero. Oh, wow. So that. Lou who? Blue Tuna Tiger. Oh, Blue Tuna. Is the name. Wow. Um, why I was looking at Blue working, Tuna fishing. It's unrelated, but I think you can answer. Okay. I'll do it this way so you guys can see. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do the same thing I just did, except I'll, I'll go a little lighter. Peter asked how much gap to have around a door. Do you? Um, it depends. Like I, like, I like using the amount that's on this reveal. It's about a sixteenth of an inch. Um, it's pretty close. But you can only really do that when you're dealing with a door that's not going to expand and contract much. It's similar to a drawer though, like on the sides you got to leave a little more opening when it's the winter and you can fit it a little tighter in the summer because it's already expanded. Okay, maybe that... I'm going to go a little lighter here. I just honed this before so maybe that's why I just... I think I'm okay there. I actually, you know, overcut that first one. I'll admit it now, just so that uh, you guys could see, uh, you know, what to avoid. Uh oh, I think I just did it again. No, I didn't. Phew. Sometimes the grain's going to dive on you. See, that was actually the step that I did it on. I leaned it, scooped it out a little too much. I'm getting right to my knife line on the back there, so I gotta be careful. Come back this way. There you go. And now I can go for the end chop. Let's make a second chop here. If I take too much, I end up getting it a little loose, top to bottom. Thomas is asking, could you just plane your door down and proceed from there? I'm not sure what that refers to. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, if I didn't have a fixed door. Yeah, exactly. That's a great idea. Good thinking. Hey, see, you must have made a mistake. Who was that? His name is Thomas. Another Thomas. All right, Thomas. You, I, spoken like a guy who's resourceful. <laughs> Maybe made a mistake or two in his life, maybe, but that's actually a good or saw thing. others. Saw others, yes. <laughs> Thank you for bailing me out. All right, so I'm going to just chop down. Now I'm going to set it in that back knife line. And this time I want to hit it lightly because I'm with the grain. 
I'm just using my knife line to set that depth. That's my three quarter inch line there. Okay, so that's almost roughed out, but I can tell I didn't go super deep right there. I'm gonna just take a little more off of that. You know, the more I can rough it out, the lighter the job is for the router plane. But here comes the router plane again to do its thing. So it's sweet. I mean, it's almost like you've got a router. Now I'm trying to pull this in. I can feel a lot of resistance. So I want to back it off and I'm going to raise this up a little bit. This is the Lee Nielsen uh, 71 that, and it's the closed throat, meaning it's closed here. They have one that's open. Um, they say is better for inlay, but I'm not sure. I mean, I, can, I feel like, how can you not see what you're doing here? I gotta be careful I don't overdo this. Make sure I've got my stop cut at the end. Okay, that feels pretty good. I'm gonna have to clean up my back wall a little more. Just bring this in. And just lean into it. That'll give me a good cut. Right into my shoulder, kind of. Lean right into it. There you go. Now I can set to my full depth. Tighten her up. And take another shaving. Just let it kind of sweep in there. And then when you get to the end, if your stop cut is deep enough, it'll release nicely. Camera lady like creeps in and I feel the light like start hitting my ear. And she keeps going. It's amazing. We sacrifice nothing. There's a lot of hands in the way. <laughs> Let the people see something. Exciting. Okay, you're right. We should have like a the little sensor, like that old game operation when you hit the sidewall. <laughs> it went eh. Every time that light hits my head, it should go eh. <laughs> Adam says, um, what is the advantage of open versus closed throat on a router plane? I'm not sure. I was just looking at them today. I didn't know. I wanted to check and see what their, what their, they had been closed for so long. A lot of their stuff was out of stock. And uh, the open one actually is not in stock, but I noticed that this one was. So not that you're going to run out and get one. I think it's like listed at 175 so they're not cheap. And for the amount you use them, I mean, do you really need it? Well, maybe you do. <laughs> All right, so here we go. We set that in, and look at that. We get that nice stop. Wow, that's pretty. Cool. That's the same distance. So there we go. Now, while we're here, let's go ahead and make our marks. Now, I'm going to show you two methods for getting these holes. I find that if you just get a nice, sharp, pencil and make a circle or a pen. Pen will work too. But you just need to really identify that location. And then I take an awl and I come and I just hit the center of that hole. And if I miss, I want to miss slightly toward this wall because I want the hinge to get pulled in, not pulled out. You see, if that hole it's a little toward thing. It'll when the screw goes in, it'll pull it in snug. Okay. If I go to the outside, when the screw goes in and that countersink starts to go, it's a, it'll draw it out a little bit. So we don't want that. We want to just go slightly, just slightly to the inside. You see, I'm not going too far there. This is a nice forgiving set because it's got the wall. It's like it's housed in there and it won't be a problem. 
Okay, with those set, now I can pre-drill for the screws, and I'll just run this in. Oops, that, it's a little deeper than I need to go. Screws are just about a half inch. Um, I don't actually have the proper screws that go with these hinges, because um, they were my last ones, and I... But usually when they send you the screws, we're, I'm not going to put these in yet. I'll wait until we get the other hinge set. But you'll get like the brass screws, which is fairly soft. And you don't want to mar this head testing and taking out. Usually they'll provide a steel, a, one or two steel versions of the same size screw. And use that for all your testing and running in. So that once you go to set those brass, there's no slipping, no marring, because we want that to look really sweet and clean when you're done, okay? Um, so that's set. Let's go ahead and get the holes pre-drilled on the other. So here we are. This is our face. So let's set that. That would go right on here. Now I want to make sure that this here we don't have that back wall. So what I'm going to do is clamp a stop. I'll bring it down so we can see. I'll just get a couple clamps here. This will help me to index it. And plus when I put the screws in, I'll have something against this like this. And it'll keep it from moving much. Um, a lot of times you'll use just one screw to start to make sure that screw is well placed. If that first screw draws it in or out, then remove it and get the others to, to correct. Set those first and then go with the last one so that it won't be able to pull it out of alignment. So with that nice and snug right up there, beautifully indexed, we'll go ahead and mark. Peter's asking, do you ever use a VIX spit or a transfer punch to mark the holes? Yes, Peter, I'm going to show you that on the next one. I wanted to show you uh, old school and um, newer methods on the, the other hinge, which will we'll jig up for it. It'll go a little faster. And there we go. So those holes are nice, but you can see how accurate you can do with this. And... It would, if you're really going for precision, you might only drill, pre-drill one hole. But I feel pretty good about my drilling right now, so I'm going to go with them all. <laughs> Not that I think about that much. All right, there we go. Beautiful. All right, so that one's ready. We'll wait um, before, until we get the bottom one. Now, let me clean up just a touch, because for this next one, we're going to make a jig. And we're going to use a router. And I'll show you how easy this can be. So let's see, should we use this one? No, we'll start we'll start with the let's start with the leg. Alright, so this is gonna go on here like this. Let's say we're gonna put we're gonna use the the two and a half at the bottom just because that's what I have, not, and we'll come up a little bit, say it right there. So we're going to set it into the door right about, right about here. So somewhere in this area right here will be our set in. So let's put this in the vise. And we can build our jig right on this leg, and then we'll set it to the proper place. Now, for this jig, pretty simple. You just need some small pieces of plywood. These are all like half-inch ply, uh, nothing fancy, but you, it would be nice if you had Baltic or something really trust, trustworthy. And I made a line on the edges that I jointed, um, so that's nice. But what I'm going to do is, 
it may not be totally obvious what I'm doing until you see it work and then you'll know why I'm doing this. But I'm going to set this up so that we're going to route and use the ends here as the guide for my bit. Now here's the bit that we're going to use. And it's in, I'm going to, the router here, this little router that's a quarter inch shank, it's, it's a half inch diameter, quarter inch high cutter with the bearing above the cutter. So the bearing's designed to follow a template and the cutter plunges below and will make whatever recess or mortise that you want. So it's perfect, the perfect bit for putting in hinges like this. If you had a lot to do, if you had a lot of hinges to do like this, you would really benefit greatly to have uh, a cutter like this. And I remember one time I was, I built like 16 bookcases and there were, so there were one, two, three, four, there were 10 hinges on each, each one. So we're looking at what, 165, all right? A lot of hinges. And so to set them all just the right depth, I built a jig like this for that. So this bearing, with this bit, by the way, is also in the notes. We're going to set this up, and the beauty of it is that that bearing is flush with the outside of the cutter. It's a half-inch bearing, half-inch cutter. And so you can build your jig exactly to the size of the hinge, and then the bearing's just going to ride and follow the size. Now, we want our depth of this hinge set to be what we had earlier, that three quarters of an inch on here. So we're right to the center of the pin. So to do that, we're gonna set this piece here. So we're gonna set it so it's three quarters inch overlaid. And then after, I'll just attach this piece out here that will be the back wall of the router. So this other piece will come in over here and we'll have our recess for our router to cut. Um, so before I can set these pieces, I have to put a stop on the bottom edge that's indexing this piece three quarters of an inch off that face. So all I'm gonna do is turn this up like that, and I'll put a little glue on here, just for kicks. And we'll use the pin nailer. I gotta make sure I have the three quarter inch pin nails. Yes, I do, okay. Let me uh, that set up. I don't <coughs> okay, so we'll just bring it in. And I cut this piece a little shorter than the length of my the first piece because I don't want I want the ends the ends are what are going to uh, the bear, bearings going to ride on of the wider piece so there we go right there I'm just pin that and then we can come down this end and again I'm nice and flush right there spot on so that's Right on the money. And let's just double check. That looks good all the way. So let's just go ahead and finish pinning that. Oh no. Oh, there was still a one inch. <laughs> there was still one of the one inch in there. I had um I had the one inch pins in there early and I switched to the three quarter, but I'll just snip it off, and we'll file it off. Hans, Peter's curious uh, if you're ever gone with an SOSS hinge for a contemporary look. The sauce hinge? Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. When I SOSS? That. The sauce hinge? Yeah. Uh, oh, my gosh. I'm trying to think. I have not... That's more of like a box hinge. Um, but I've never used it on a door because I, I guess I haven't made that type of piece.
piece. I would think of them on a box. Um, that's where I normally think of that type of hinge, but so no, I haven't used one. So there's one of mine. Um, we've got that three quarter inch offset, but I'm sure that those hinges are probably have a lot more applications than just boxes. So I have not a lot of familiarity with them actually. Okay, so now I'm gonna Could do the same here. <laughs> SOSS. Well, they they could be called that. Why not? Um, so then we bring this in. We'll get this set back again. And get it about right down that end. We don't... I'm glad I didn't have my finger under that trusting the length of that pin that would have been a little rude surprise okay. okay done this end same thing just kidding <laughs> All right, so there we go. We got uh, nicely spaced all the way down. Okay, so now that I've got that, I can build the actual jig. So I need the hinge. This is going to be the spacer because it's going to make the exact opening for that flush bit to ride. So this is where it's super easy. I've got my offset here. I'll put this against here. I'm going to first attach one. This is like a backer piece here. So this will go... This is going to connect the two to create the gap of the opening, okay? So let's just get this one started on this end. Let's put a little glue on here. Oh, this is where I need to switch out to the one inch. Hang on a second. Ron's uh, curious if you would agree and talk about the importance of quality hinges that are considered in size and consistent in size. Yeah, Box Ron. Store hinges that, that can vary um, and cause lots of trouble. To, yes, to I, I meant to. I think I, I mentioned that at the beginning, um, talking about these precision butt hinges that I got from Horton. They're extremely consistent and accurate with the holes, the size, everything about them. Where when you get into these rolled leaf, you could get the cheaper hinges are going to be not cut the same. And if you try to do a jig like this, you need to know that you have a consistent, reliable, accurate hinge because you're going to just go ahead and cut all your recesses. You're not customizing them to everyone because you can trust that they're all equally sized. So that's my big, um, what I really like about those from Horton, but I'm sure there are other ones around, but um, I know you can't go wrong with those. All right, so there we go. We've got a nice and snug there, okay? It's flush across the top. And I'm just, this first one, I'm just gonna pin on here. So I'm just gonna come in. And here, I don't wanna get my fingies. I'll be going to the hospital sooner than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh hold, doctor. Yeah, didn't I see you the other day? Yeah, actually. <laughs> not in the same manner okay so now we're gonna go this way now we're gonna bring in the hinge now this one I bent it a little bit so I'll, I'll go with the flat leaf um, and that's my spacer so the hinge goes in there and let's just set it up here for a second and I'll put a little glue on this and we'll finish the jig this easy okay you have two like right angles with the offset and then one long strip that's going to connect them. And you just set that hinge between them. Whoops. Set it and forget it. <laughs> okay, set it. Nice, butted it right up against there. Butt the butt. And then bring this together. See, it's nice and snug. That's exactly what you want. 
then we're going to go ahead and pin this. All right, I know some of you are very nervous about me getting hurt, and I don't blame you. It, I always worried about other people getting hurt more than myself. Uh, but that's the way it is. Something about a, a nail like this. Okay, I don't have to keep it down there. Now that I'm pinned, I can bring it up like this, and we'll finish her off like that. Beautiful. There it is, okay? That's all you need for this bit. It's got the nice opening, the gap. It's, it's nice and snug. That's going to be beautiful. And I've got the offset I want to the stop right here. So I'm going to get my three-quarter inch, and it's going to hit that stop right there. So let's go ahead. We're going to set it in here. Let me get it up on the actual bench here. And I'll put a couple clamps on there. Oh, what do you know? I got these right here. I will... Steve's curious, uh, aren't you still going to have to square the corners after the router work? Yes, you do, Steve. You do have a little bit of chiseling, but I'll show you how easy that is. I mean, if you think about it, it's a, it's a half-inch round cutter, so the radius is only a quarter inch. So it's like you got this little quarter inch radius left, left in the corner, which we will easily take care of. And what's, what's really great about it is, as I'll show you in a second, is you can square up the corners using the template because the template is accurate. So we're going to use that as the guide to square it up before we pop it off. So it's easier than you may even think. So, cool. yeah, what we're going to do now is set the bit. Um, now, normally I do some testing on another piece, but let's just let me just show you how I would go about. I don't care if I slightly miss on the depth here because I want to just, in the interest of time, get this hinge in. So I'm going to bring it down until it just just touches there and I'm gonna lock it okay so now it's stopped and it's just touching there now I'm gonna take my stop and if I loosen the stop that depth stop is moving it's hitting the full depth now that's zero because I'm at zero right there so if I just take my leaf and I lift this up and I put one of the leaves in there that's the thickness of the leaf so I'm going to lock that in remove it it's in there snug and so now when I plunge I'll plunge until I hit that depth stop well actually let me reset that I didn't have it in the right spot but it's easy because I nothing changed. I didn't move anything. Let's bring that down again. Just going to be not too firm with it. Just and then we're going to lock it in, and then we go. Okay. So now when I plunge, it should be pretty darn close. But I would, I usually I do a test piece on another piece. But let's just go for it on this one. Pretend we did, and it's probably going to be pretty darn close either way and it should be fine what do, what do we can you close that? Is it, okay, close that? i i can't like, oh, i can i can i can move this the camera lady multitasks like you wouldn't believe and then she also has a sign language with me these various gestures that are going on that I can't even mention sometimes. All right, there we go. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All right, so let me get my headphones on. And of course, the safety glasses. All right, so when I route this, um, there's a chance if I, I could get some tear out with a router bit, sometimes it'll pull fibers and pop them out. Um, but if you're looking down on the router, it's spinning clockwise. So if I start on the left side and I come over, it's like the cutter, it has a lifting motion to the material that I'm going into because it's clockwise. Okay, so it's lifting and it could pull fibers out. 
However, if I go from right to left, it's spinning and the left side is going to be hitting in to the material and that where it's coming out on the right side has already been cut. So it's a, going to give you a cleaner cut if you move in the direction of the spin sort of. So that's called a climb cut too because you're not, when you're usually using a router, you're pulling against the spin or rotation of the bit. Here, it's such a light cut, I can control it and go with the cut to make a climb cut, which gives you that cleaner cut, okay? That's why you get a cleaner cut with a climb cut because it's cutting down into the fibers instead of lifting. All right, so here we go. Back to plan. Okay, so it's nice and flush right to the, the jig. So I'm going to use the jig to square the corners. So it's just that little bit of material. I'll go down. Should probably go this way first. That's my stop cut. I don't want to cut my jig, I'm just using it. So that's another advantage of this flush cutting bit. And it just beautifully releases that little cut in the corner, okay? And then we'll just come in this way. And that should be good. Let's pop it out. A lot easier than chiseling and routing. Once you get this, then you can set up and cut them all. Let's check it out and see how it fits. I think I got a little more to clean out on the corners. Yeah, I do. Hold it. I couldn't. That's one thing about it. It's hard to see down in there. So I just got a little more. But I've already got the sidewalls. So I can also use the pre-cut. So if I didn't get it all the way. I did. That cut pretty nice. Okay. Now I'm going to come in this way. That's good. So once you do the first couple, you sort of realize what you're trying to do. And then you can fit that in. That's beautiful. Pretty flush, too. Just the slightest bit under, but no, that's pretty good. Look at that. So now that much faster to create that one. Now let's transfer it into the door. We'll put our hinges in and we'll be done. So let's see, what can we do here? I'll put this in the vise. Bring this over. And so we're gonna align that top one. Like that. This, so this, to get the spacing correct, that looks really nice. Now down here, we're gonna knife across to show where we're gonna set the jig. Yeah. Let me get this guy. It's hard to see with that one. And then make sure I didn't move. I did slightly. Looks good. I don't know why I'm being too fussy because it's really a door to nowhere. <laughs> I'm being fussy just because I want the hinges to line up when I go to put them in, right? 
if you're not accurate with these knife cuts, your hinges won't go in together. <laughs> so there you go. All right, so here's my cut. And here's my cut. So I'm gonna use those to align my jig right to that. So let's go ahead and we're gonna turn this, get this in the vise. Bring our jig in, get jiggy here. And man, it's so nice. I can see the knife cuts just lining up perfectly on each side, just perfect. And I'm gonna put clamp on here. Just need to snug this on. Move a little. There we go. That's nice. Where's my other? Here it is. Wow, Lupe says she's making a prototype for a hundred boxes. A so prototype? She's going to be a handy jig. Oh, you're going you're gonna to make um, all the hinges. That's cool. You have to send us a photo. Guy's asking, couldn't you use the first hinge as a marker of sorts to lock everything in place? <coughs> uh, yes, yeah, you can. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you could have slid it right in there. That's right. You reminded me of all the things. I mean, there are little things that'll come up as you're working that are intuitive that I have not done this for a while, so I'm not thinking of. But that's an excellent idea. That becomes your your placer, your placement. All right, there we go. Um, that's right on. And <laughs> let's put my earmuffs on. And this is it. We're gonna just hit the other one and clean it up, get the holes in, and see what we got. All right, uh, my glasses. Hmm. I keep thinking that's up, but it's not. There it is. Here we go. piece of cake. So you can also build these jigs so that they're longer. And this is what I did, I think, on that larger project. And you have the different gaps for the different hinges. Like I could have made this a double jig. Um, however, they have to be reversible. That's the only problem. They don't, sometimes you need the right and the left of the exact same jig. So it doesn't work in every case. But Still, it's a, just to get this much, it's a nice time saver. So we just use the jig again, make the nice cut. We're good to go. And we can just true it up, come in this way. One should be able to see, so there. That's better, right? <laughs> So that's, that's why I don't use the router plane, the hand one, that much because, I mean, look, you get a very similar depth set. And then, let's see, which side is the face? Yeah, that's right. So it goes right in here. Boy, oh, that's snug. It's in there. i got to just trim a touch more off. Excuse Right where I was squaring it up, I kind of, right here, I think this is the culprit. So when you get into the repetition, like I said, see how that, now that fits perfect. You'll get into the nuances that, you know, stopped you from getting it right the first time. Now, this one, I wanted the hinges to be flush 
with this side. So I'll use that backer block here. Oh good, I can get them both on at the same time. So let's just go ahead and do this and we can, let's see, I'm gonna use a stronger one here. Now I'm gonna use that, um, a different way of drilling the holes. So here we go. What, what do we call that bit again? Somebody asked. Vix bit, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, Peter, so instead of just drilling freehand with a drill bit, I've got this little sprung-loaded Vix bit, which has the countersink of the same countersink of these hinges. So, and then as it's spring-loaded in here, so as I push down, the bit comes out and it's centered in that opening. But look at, see how there's a little play there? Sometimes the hole will surprise you and not be in the middle and it can be frustrating. But see how I just, all you do is you set it right in there and it seats beautifully and then you just plunge to pre-drill. Um, maybe there's some better ones. If anybody knows some that have little to no play, I'd like to know that. Um, I'm not sure if you can get away with that, but there isn't a great, there's a loose tolerance right in here. See how that moves around, that lead piece? And that's what causes it, actually. So what I actually do to correct for that is, similar to what I said the, just a minute ago, is about favoring one side of the, the hinge so that it pulls in the direction you prefer to go. So once I set it in there, I'm going to, now I don't have to draw a circle. I don't have to use the all or pre-drill. I just set this right in. Now I'm going to favor, push it to the right. So if I do get a, a bad hole there, it'll pull it into the setting into this board nicely. That looks pretty good actually. I don't have the link to this though. So if anybody knows a good source for these VIX bits, go ahead and share it. We'd love to know. But look at how they're, they're already, they look pretty well centered. And given that we are now ready to go, I'm gonna run the screws in. So I'm gonna use these, these are not the proper screws. They're like, they feel like one size too large. I think they're actually sevens. These might even be fives that come with the Horton brasses. If anyone knows that, go ahead and chat that in too. I'd like to know. Um, but I ran out of them either way. When they send them with them, you don't need to know what size they are. But now the trick we always did with Pug was put a little beeswax on there. And the traditional screws were always flathead. So it was kind of like a purist move. If I was making 18th century reproductions, I would never put a Phillips head screw in. Um, I mean, I still don't like doing it. So they actually give you the choice when you buy these hinges. You know, if you're doing a large job and you're trying to run them and it doesn't matter, the Phillips are definitely the way to go. But they may ask you if you order hinges like this, do you want flat or Phillips? And uh, so it kind of depends on the application. Okay, so I'm gonna just, see I did I'll put the screw so it's nice and horizontal. And I kind of went against, I felt it pull. It's right up against there, but the screw's a little big, but it's not gonna matter because we got that 16th inch gap. And I just wanna show you how they actually sit in here. This is the only thing. With the beeswax, it boy, it really helps. It goes in really easy. And then you always just find that place where it snugs up and get your screw heads horizontal, or you can go the other way if you want, but it's, it's kind of a nice move to have them all aligned. Charles is suggesting Snappy has a, has a good set. Oh, okay, and great. Bert says white side. Okay, awesome. David's asking, is that one of those special screwdrivers that actually fits the slot? 
Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does fit actually pretty nicely. Sometimes you need to just actually flatten the ends of your screwdrivers, but I have three. My mic is down. Keep going. I have three different screwdrivers that have that flat head. Oh, so you need to say that thing again about the... Oh, yeah, let me repeat. Sorry, guys, I had my mic down. Um, Charles mentioned that Snappy has a good set of VIX... Would you still call them VIX bits? I believe so, yeah. Okay. I think it's kind of like a... And Bert mentioned uh, white side. Okay, beautiful. Maybe we can put those links in. I don't know, Snappy. I have to take a look at that. Or you guys can just check it out. Peter's curious if you clock your screw head threads. Clocking the screws. Clock them. Um, tell me what that means again. Maybe I'm not. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Clock them meaning align the the lines. I do try to put them all in the same line. Maybe, uh, maybe that's what he means, yeah. If that's the correct term for alignment, that's what I was trying to say earlier. Yeah, how do you align the screws? Yeah, so I do. I, I usually go with our snug, and you can see these. Uh, I would go back after. It's kind of anal. This is so exciting. But I just go, like, right there, boom. <laughs> it does take a while to finish... You know, anytime you do a piece like this, but there you go. So that one's done, and having that straight edge on there is going to help you pull it in. That will work well on the che on the uh, blanket chest project because the the barrel or the leaf sits like on the inside. When you open it up, you're going to feel these feel beautiful, nice and flush, because I had that there. Okay, but on the other end, we don't need that because. We have the stop on the leg, so let's bring that in. And did I put that on wrong? No. Whew. For a minute, I almost thought I did. So here, well, let's get this in the vise. I don't know how I could do it wrong, actually, unless I did them backwards. And then we set it in. You want to see that go in? Whoops. I feel like Julia Child. Well, I almost had an accident. <laughs> okay, there we go. I'm going to get that one started so okay. I can pre-drill the others. What's that? Sacred Julia. She's the best. <laughs> okay. And then once this is snugged in, then it'll give us beautiful alignment, and we can check our other beautiful right there. So sometime, at some point, we'll have a project where we, here soon enough, where we do involve real hinge setting, and uh, we'll go over it specifically for that project. Like, there may be some nuances that are different. So, you know, even if you don't totally get this and you're not going to do it right now, we will... And we do it in a project in the future. We'll cover this again, I'm sure, for numerous types of hinges. But they all can be kind of laid out and knifed in and free-handed and set like that. It's just more time-consuming. But if you can set up a jig, you have nice, consistent hinges. Like even the, the knife hinges come, and they're very accurate. The sauce hinges are very jig-friendly. And you can just really move along with that setup. So here we go. Again, I'm going to push it over. All right, let's just get these screws in. Three more. And see the door to nowhere. <laughs> I spent so much time making this door. <laughs> it's a nothing door but we have it on video yeah so I'm pulling down this bent hinge that one's a little funky bits look how nice they line up there they ended up being spot on but it's a um, it's a nice you get such an accurate visual 
with that jig being the perfect size of the the jig opening being the perfect size of the hinge. There we go. Oh yeah, rat tail hinges Michael's mentioning. Yes, yeah, yeah. I've got those on, on a cabinet in the house. I love those. And some of the English hinges are just really gorgeous. I, they're just expensive to get shipped over here, but I think the English make some of the finest hinges. Little shout out to you guys over there. I know some of you are watching. You, you, you always tell me how spot on I am. <laughs> All right, there it is. All right, so, oh, it feels flush too. Look it. It's kind of hard to see that it opens to nowhere. So exciting. But we've got a hinging flap of wood. Isn't that awesome? It's cool. And you know, I. The reveal's a little different because I use up here, the hinge is bent there too. I could have synced that a little more because I got to pull that. I don't think I'll be able to pull the men out, but. Yeah, door at the top of the stairway to heaven. <laughs> That's right. It's a stairway to heaven right here. So because I use two different methods, I use the hand router plane up here to set the depth and I used the router method down here to set the depth. I can see that my gap is a little wider here. It's actually a little nicer, just slightly. But isn't that nice the way the barrel is just discreetly protruding? Okay, so it's half the barrel and it gives you a really beautiful job. Now, if you didn't like this, like you can, you can always do a test with a couple pieces of scrap and check the barrel set. It's not it's not wrong to set your leaves under a little if you want even a tighter reveal, okay? You could make them even tighter, but we're about a nickel fit there. I don't have a nickel in my pocket, but that's about what it looks like. Um, it could be even a little finer. So that would just mean slightly adjusting your depth setting. Well, that's curious if you ever run into your hinges not being uh, the same size. Claude, uh, yeah, Claude, that's what I was mentioning. Um, not with the, not with the, uh, those Horton Brass precision butt hinges. So I sound like I'm doing an ad for them. I'm not, <laughs> uh, but shout out to you guys. You've been great all these years. Uh, they really, they are a great company, really good service and all that. Um, but they, the, these hinges are just, Identical. I don't know how they're machining them, but I'm sure they're doing it in such a way that they're getting true uniformity hinge to hinge. So I don't... But you're saying that, that the box stores, that's not always the case. No, no, you can't rely on it. I mean, it's just, you have to ask the question when you order them online, you know, if you order them with someone and you're able to talk to them. Um, but, you know, the, the more you pay for a hinge, the more precise and hinge to hinge it's going to be. A lot of hinges are just, sometimes they're just too complex and they're actually made for routing slots. And qu quite a few of them you'll actually see the ends will be rounded to conform with a router bit. So you just plunge, run to the stop. There's no squaring the corners. The, the actual knife hinge or whatever the hinge is will have a rounded end and it makes it super easy to set the hinge or the lock because your jig can be set uh, to be set up right off the router bit. So yeah, it's, all, it's a lot of what you pay for, the precision that you're gonna get. Any other questions? Uh, no. Well, I wish it was a little more satisfying result where the door was closing into an opening and it looked really great, but it's sort of like an outhouse, but you know, we get our, we get our thrills in other ways <laughs> on this, this yeah. little jam here. But I just want to thank you all for hanging out with us. We do appreciate you more than you know. Mm -hmm. We love all the comments we get. We mm -hmm. are really over, overwhelmed by it so often. So thank you for being a part of it and for hanging out with us in the shop for a little while here. And, um, remember to like, share, and subscribe. 
and tell your friends because we're we're just a rocket ship growing. <laughs> no, we, it's just a slow growth, but I like it because the kind of growth we have on this channel, I think, is deep and slow. But I mean, that's really what matters, right? We're we're I feel like we're building a lot of relationships, even amongst yourselves. I see a lot of great things happening. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah. We're looking forward to meeting a few of you here in the coming months for our special events. And, but until then, we look forward to seeing you back here next week on behalf of the camera lady and myself. We'll see you next time right back here on Shop Night Live. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Yes. Good night, everybody. Thank you for being here, working it out with us. Have a great weekend.